this is a real joy for me this morning to share the hour with John and Pamela. On a day that is set aside in the United States and several other countries to celebrate and honor mothers. With so many hearts open on this occasion, I thought it might be useful to focus on what honoring our mother means and why this desire is so fundamental to our being. First, we know our very presence here on earth was dependent on our earthly mother. She was our living connection into this dimensional world. Our umbilical cord, literally and figuratively. Without mother and father, we wouldn't be here. This miraculous event of our birth alone is deserving of our utmost respect and appreciation for the presence of mother. But the forces which designed and created our human forms in the protected womb of our mother did not suddenly take a holiday when we were born and say, okay, you are now on your own to fend for yourself in the world as vulnerable as you are. No, the provision of mother continues. There is this invisible bond that connects mother to child. It is universal. If we looked at this phenomenon strictly at a physical level, we would see that both mother and child are releasing endorphins and oxytocin. Checking out with my husband over there is a physician. <laughs> During the labor process, which foster a powerful bonding between mother and child. So in post-birth, a mother and newborn will stare into each other's eyes, mimic each other's gestures, crave frequent attention and touch, and have a great need to be close to each other. The mother develops a fierce desire to protect her baby, to care for her, to nurture him, and to, say, to sustain life in her child. From our vantage point, we know that spirit precedes form. So this special invisible bond doesn't originate at a chemical level. Otherwise, once the hormones stop releasing, the bond would disappear. Not so. The mother-child bond is a connection that remains throughout our lifetime. Even if our relationship with our biological mother is not sustained for one reason or another, there is always the provision of mother. The presence of the one spirit of mother is here now. She has not gone anywhere. Just look at mother nature and the myriad living forms surrounding us on this planet as our food source in companionship. What would the world be like without the songbirds and the cute beluga whale who is caught on camera this week fetching someone's cell phone from the ocean depths? How precious is that? Or the bees who are busy pollinating the flowers for the plants to grow. The trees that provide shelter and oxygenate our air to breathe. 
why would we not do everything in our power to love and protect this home among the stars? And what about the unfailing love for mankind? Certainly as a species, we hardly deserve it. But our very presence here in this moment gives indication that there is hope we will wake up to our responsibilities in tending and keeping this garden. But we should not try mother's patience. I have often heard mothers say, I just want to raise happy and healthy children who will grow up to make a positive difference in this world. Where does that desire come from? If not from the very nature of mother, whom we embody naturally through our hearts. That selfless love, which gives our concern, which gives without concern for results which does not condemn or put down, which protects and keeps all living things safe and desires for all living things to thrive and reach their full potential. We honor mother by personifying her nature. I was reminded of a moment in time when I was a young girl and my mother was hosting a dinner party. And this is no small feat for a mom who had six children to tend to and lots to prepare. As a family, we all dined in our small kitchen where the inevitable glass of milk would spill or the vegetables we weren't too fond of found their way to the floor if they didn't make it to the dog's mouth first. So the formal dining room was preserved for the special guests, the grown-up company whom my mom and dad loved to entertain. When the tarnished silverware made an appearance to be polished, I was usually the one assigned to the job. Depending on the number of guests attending, the place settings could be numerous and take time and elbow grease to clean. But I didn't mind. I love shining up those forks and spoons and knives and the coffee and teapots. So when they were placed on the table, they sparkled. Then my mom brought out her mother's china and we set that out. And it was elegant. There was magic in this moment for me which did not lie solely in creating a beautiful setting with my mother, but in giving something back to her. So she would shine for all to see. Is that not the heart? Is that not in our heart of heart? Our deepest desire to let the spirit of our mother shine in this world so all may know the blessings of her eternal presence here and now because we love her nature and we express it and we care, and we keep her garden, particularly the garden of our hearts. And that's how we honor our mother in this day and every day. Is that such a difficult task? Hardly. It's far more difficult to resist her than to welcome her spirit into our hearts. There is joy 
waiting to be known. The likes of which we have not seen in this world for a very long time. So let our hearts be open to receive her and may she pour us out a blessing today. So that is my portion, Pamela, and I am turning the microphone over to you, my friend. Joyce, thank you so much, my friend, too. I love your spirit. I always have. And it conveyed it so beautifully as you were speaking of the spirit of mother. I, too, have been considering it as a metaphor of motherhood, whether one has a child or not. And my thoughts have to do with the opportunity to provide a womb-like atmosphere for others that encourages the excellence in them to emerge. Support that spirit. I feel it's such a hindrance to anyone's emergence of self-purpose to try to manipulate what we think they should become or steer them in a direction we think they should go. No, that's not what a mother does. That is not the mother's spirit. The womb is nurturing. This Mother's Day and every day, I give such profound gratitude for my own mother. I'm glad Joyce brought in her mother in the picture too, because I'd like to pay tribute to my mother, Dorothea McCann, for a few minutes. She provided that womb of nurturing love without judgment or manipulation so that I could find my own purpose in life. I was blessed with a home rich in spiritual atmosphere. I was taught spiritual things by example. For instance, my mother had an attunement practice in our home in Iowa. And when people would come for attunements, She'd invite me to sit at their feet. I don't remember how old I was, but I was a child. She didn't explain or instruct the art or spirit of attunement. She didn't tell me about vibrationally balancing the body's energy by placing the hands a few inches above the contact points of the endocrine glands. No, no, I just sat and observed. And gradually, I remember feeling such profound peace. And I noticed that people that came for an attunement did as well. And they felt renewed when they left our home. There was no manipulation as to how the body, the mind, or the spirit should be or become, but simply letting love radiate. In those sessions of attunement, I learned respect for the natural healing process. And I was thinking as Sanford was speaking recently of the privilege. I learned the privilege of simply letting spirit move. My mother would often invite local ministers of the three denominations in our town to our home for coffee and conversation. And I'd sit quietly listening in the other room the conversation always turned to things of a spiritual nature. 
the men didn't always agree with what she challenged about religion, but they respected her and always invited her to contribute a message in the annual World Day of Prayer event. I observed and I learned from my mother the art of living in the world the way it is with the myriad of people that are there and simply letting love radiate. My mother provided that womb of encompassment for children less fortunate who didn't have that in their lives. For the first five years of my life, we cared for a variety of foster children in our home. Our home was always full of children to care for. From teaching Sunday school to leading a campfire girls troop to welcoming my friends for sledding or sleepovers, children were bathed in her all-encompassing spirit and in all this and so much more I developed a passion for my life's work that of letting the attunement spirit guide me in raising our children and in my various career experiences over the years, the core of what I trust I provided for them was the attunement spirit. Being one with spirit so that one can come in contact with that feeling, that familiar feeling of it and let that be expressed in their own living. My question of myself always was, how can I assist others to know their own self-worth? What can I do to help? Over the years working with many people, I could see what didn't work, and that was taking the attitude of what can I do to fix? And I've learned through experience that I can't fix things in others. No matter how worthy the cause, no matter how close the person is to me. I have many connections with people now, both in the school system and friends and some are dealing with difficult things like depression the challenge of having autistic children heightened discrimination I see in the school system now I'm sure in the workplace even child abuse and generally the myriad of human heartache. I can't of myself fix any of it. I know that my greatest gift must be a clear emotional realm so that I can be an instrument of peace and healing. If I'm worried and upset with what I see or feel in others, I can't offer peace. I find what meets emotional turmoil of any kind, be it in people or just knowing about it in this volatile world we have, is the intensification of radiant love. That intensification of love is the heart of attunement. Unless the heart is pure, serene, untroubled, the healing current cannot go beyond me. 
I think our eyes have a part to play in all this. I feel that our eyes are God's instrument of service, maybe secret service. It's said that the eyes are the windows of the soul. And when we look at another, we can share that attunement spirit of peace and well-being and a message that really all is well. When I greet my students lined up at my classroom door, I welcome them individually with words, but my eyes say, you're a special gift from God. Let your spirit free. I'm conscious of my eyes, scanning my world daily, deliberately. God's secret service. And in all this, I'm reminded of the example of Mary in the Bible, who kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. You know, we're aware of all the troubling things in the world. But part of what I call secret service is the state of heart with no judgment, no blame, no manipulation. The untroubled heart is the instrument for the intensity of love. And these days are ripe for that intensification of love current. It challenges the chaos and all that's impure. The pure heart. The mother's heart. As Martin Cecil said, here, earth's pains are healed. I think we're called to play our part, to restore the earth to order and to beauty. Thank you for this opportunity to share my thoughts. <clears throat> Joyce and Pamela, beautiful. Honoring Mother and the spiritual bonds that we know, providing a nurturing presence for everyone. Mm. Pamela spoke of her mother, Dorothea McCann. <laughs> I feel uh, honored to have known Dorothea for the last uh, 15 years of her lifetime. How many people can say they have or had a divine mother-in-law? Each of us, each uh, human being and, and the body of humanity as a totality was and is designed to give birth to the things of God on earth. I love that in the Spanish language, hola Fernando, the phrase meaning to give birth is dar luz, literally to give light. Some of us on the, on the teleconference today remember a song called Where Beauty Might Be Born, 
written and composed by uh, Chris Foster and Bill Thompson. The song's refrain is, for God did make the earth a womb where beauty might be born. Indeed. Of course, there must first be conception in the womb in a safe and secret place. And then a cycle of gestation follows to a point of birth. The earth is, is not only a womb, but, but the body of Mother God. Uh, we see beauty in the world. And while this may be most abundantly evident in, in the living realms of nature, I don't restrict this observation to the natural world alone. Human beings can give birth to beauty in numerous ways, as in visual and performing arts, in music, in literature, in science, in, math in mathematics. In fact, any action, any expression that's creative and uplifting. The greatest musical geniuses, say a Mozart or a Beethoven, or the greatest of artists, such as Michelangelo or Leonardo da Vinci, are rare in the extreme. Everyone, however, has some beautiful qualities, or at least the potential of them. But what has been achieved in human experience? Even what are seen as the greatest artistic and scientific accomplishments are to me, but the faintest hints of what is truly possible. Humanity has been bumbling along around in the dark throughout most of history, wondering why we're here, making an unholy mess of things. When rays of light do find their ways through dense hearts and minds, people congratulate themselves on their creativity and innovation without any idea of the real source of, of that illumination. Mother Earth has been pillaged and ransacked, brutally abused by ignorant humans. She has immense capacity to forgive being treated this way. But the deep damage done cannot be undone. Humpty Dumpty cannot be put back together again. She's scrambled. People want to fix the environment, reduce greenhouse gases, switch to renewable energy sources, stop polluting the air and water, etc. While these are commendable desires, the self-centered human state that produces the ill effects really hasn't any chance of starting things over, or doing it right, of fixing the mess. Because that very state of consciousness and identity is itself the cause of the problem. No matter the intention, nothing that's done accomplishes anything worthwhile until and unless there is a whole new experience of identity. The old perpetrator must and will pass away. All along the inner reality, the, the individual and collective source of life itself has been present and is present. 
Divine identity is experienceable, knowable, right now. All that's necessary is to turn from self-serving ways and to raise head and heart to receive it. But if it's that easy, why have so few human beings done it? How it's done has been demonstrated to humanity. But who sees the way? The heavenly hosts scratch their heads in wonderment at this. People live in worlds of illusion inside dense darkness. But that experience need not persist. The time will come when it cannot persist. Picture two rooms adjacent to one another in a well seal and with, well, with a wall dividing and a well sealed door in that wall between them. One room is utterly dark, and the other has windows and is full of sunlight. Now find the door, turn the knob, and open it. Does the darkness stream into the light room? Obviously not. The light dispels the darkness because the darkness isn't anything of itself, just the absence of light. You and I are the light sources of our worlds of personal experience. We're here to give birth to divine light, streaming from the undimensional into this world of space and time. And we see the world in the light we express. How do things look? To me, the most beautiful part of all creation is a human being. We aren't man-made. We're God-made. And that is the source of beauty. The essences of everything truly beautiful on earth derive from Mother God, whether people have a conscious awareness of that or not. And we are in form, made in the image and likeness of our heavenly mother and father. We hear a lot these days about the Me Too movement and about strong women asserting themselves in a variety of ways. We also hear a lot about the varied reactions of males to that. <laughs> I, I see all this stuff as distorted, uh, misinterpreted reactions to true impulses. Where spirit moves, there is purification. And one result of that is the rebalancing of masculine and feminine within ourselves, within the body of those who share awareness of spiritual expression and within the overall body of humankind. We, we hear the word misogyny in the news, the hatred, dislike, or mistrust of women or prejudice against women. Let's, let's not be fooled. This isn't really about notions of, of social equality. It has deep roots in the dark. 
and that soil is being turned for a new garden to appear. When the spirit of Mother God is no longer desecrated, she is revealed. Here's a description from the book of Revelation in the Bible. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. I thank the two sun-clothed women who spoke before me. Today, as noted, is Mother's Day in many parts of the world. We let our understanding expand. Isn't every day Mother's Day? If there are others who would like to add to what's been offered today, now is the time. Beloved Joyce, beloved Pamela, and beloved John, this is John LeBaron speaking, and I would most be delighted and privileged to join in with you in the honorable and celebratory acknowledgement of Mother God coming into spiritual manifestation this morning with you two dear ladies. Such powerful expression and yet so beautifully gentle and sweet. And John, you're bringing to focus so importantly, spirit of Father God that Mother God is in union with so important, so vital to be acknowledged in the world in this day. My eyes have been streaming pretty well the constant time we've been together in the power that has been being expressed and running through my consciousness. I take unto my, into my heart fully the spirit spiritual combination and blending, such beautiful blending of what all three of you have brought so beautifully to focus and so importantly in this day. I'm with you in presence and acknowledgement. Thank you so much. Well, here's Shirley Malin following up to give 
deep thanksgiving for what has transpired thus far. I, I always love your passion, John. You do have a, a deep moving heart and for good reason for what we share today. Interestingly enough, it is Mother's Day and I'm sure most of us women can be grateful for participating in that that uh, realm of function in the human world. But now to be able to take it to this level is truly an honor, a privilege, and a huge responsibility. And I want to thank Joyce and Pamela so much for the beauty of what was brought. And I know, having lived in the woman world of the human nature state, that it is so important that we learn as women to truly honor and love and rejoice in the womanhood that we know in one another. Women are so fraught with this jealousy thing and competition and all kinds of human nature traits, but it is a joy to know the true love of womanhood because one experiences it in one's own life and receives that of other women who would offer it. So I thank you both so much for what you have been offering over the many years in this incarnation. And we've come to a point together where we can share in this wonderful communion. And then to have the male in John bring it forth with great thanksgiving because it has been received. His love has been received in the earth and he has allowed his own strength of manhood to manifest in a substantial way over many years. So here's a beautiful example that is playing out for all of us to participate in on the phone lines and beyond. But there's just no ignoring it anymore. I, I feel we're in a victory stage. It's a very powerful point of movement right now. So I, I want to thank the three and then John, the four of you all, for this beautiful service today. In great rejoicing. Thank you. John, this is Tessa, and I just want to thank you for the, in one sense, you, with mothering in hand, were speaking. I've been on the receiving end of men speaking, and it's harsh and strong and manipulative and, oh, Lord, I tell you, and to have some, in other words, we, we, you brought strength, but it was beautifully softened because of your technically feminine side. So the two were speaking together, and it's a joy. I've had to deal with a lot of childhood trauma, probably through fathers and people close to me who behave badly. And I've done a lot in myself to sort that lot out. And then you come on to an hour like this and you think this is real bomb. This is what gets me up in the morning. The combination of a real man touched by his heart. And I really want to thank you deeply from sort of so many levels in me. You're a new man for me. You always have been, and you always will be. But there's something else. It's just none, none of the brutal, harsh, err. Uh. And I have to say, what about the brutal, harsh, masculine in me? 
Do something about that, Tessa. Do something about that as a woman. So I give enormous thanks for today on so many levels. I saw Martin on video this morning talking about the earth having raped, have the human humanity having raped the planet. It was such a shock. 1985, I think he said that. Oh, thank God you're here, John. Thank you, God, we're all here. Just such a blessing, real attunement hour. Thank you. Well, there may be others who might wish to speak. I don't want to cut anyone off, but uh, I'll jump back in at this point and uh, thank those who have added comments and words. And the thought that comes to mind here is that real uh, friendship, clear-hearted friendship among women is exceedingly precious. What is possible to be born through an individual is bright and, and, and magnificent, but what is possible to be born through a body of people, both men and women, where there is clear-hearted purity, that changes the world and that's where the healing that's so needed happens and not at all in any way that people might expect. Healing means being made whole and we're experiencing the process of being made whole together. Again, very deep thanks to Joyce and to Pamela. I am blessed beyond words to be with Pamela all these years. We just had our 47th wedding anniversary last month. There are no words. I love you. Bye all.